the ego feeds on the sexual force, which is the force that the spirit uses to create on this level of reality. So in that sense, the being and the ego rely on the same creative force, the sexual force, the force of Divine Mother Devi Kundalini Shakti, because she has the power to create and destroy. The difference is, is that the being uses that power to create consciously and to create objectively beauty and truth for the sake of others. The ego wastes that force, uses that force to feed itself so that it can replicate itself, proliferate and dominate. In other words, it uses the creative force entirely for selfish, self-serving reasons. Whereas the being uses the creative force for selfless, altruistic reasons. On this level, on the level of the mortal vessel, the mortal vehicle. And it is on that level that the great, what they call the eternal conflict between good and evil plays out for the soul of humanity. Because the consciousness, the divine soul, is being fought over because it's that consciousness that is hypnotized by the ego. It is that consciousness that is despirited and it is made to identify with the stimulation and gets lost in the simulation. And consciousness is also a kind of energy. It's a type of energy, but it's not the same as the creative force. It is the creative spark. It's a very, it's the masculine energy. Even that's not even an accurate way to say it. It's just a more subtle version of that energy. A long time ago, we did a lecture on prana and how everything is prana. Everything is basically different levels and more and more subtle levels of the creative force of the body of the Divine Mother. And it's just that prana is expressed in different levels of subtlety at different levels and in different dimensions. But in order for the egos to truly feed on that energy, they need to condition it. They need to sub subject it to their subjective programming. They need to lower that energy to their level. And in order to do that, they have to consume that energy and have it flow down and out. They have to invert it so that it flows negatively. And that's why when we were talking about the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, and we talked about stimulation, that the stimulation of the physical organism of the, of the human-like machine is one of the ways that the egos get to feed on us because they feed on, for example, nervous energy. They feed on anxiety. They feed on depression. They feed on lustful thoughts. They feed on gluttonous thoughts, on prideful thoughts and prideful emotions and, and negative emotions in general. So that's why the cult of positivity exists. But what they don't understand is that the cult of positivity is just like carpeting over mold, right? Because all the negativity continues unabated in the subconscious mind. And you're just, it's, you're just repressing emotions and you're repressing these things. And you're just, you think out of sight, out of mind, and I'm going to push positivity, positivity, positivity. But then the egos are still draining you of your energy and they're still consuming. They're just doing it out of sight, out of mind, like mice in your house that you're not aware of. And they're slowly destroying or, or termites, right? In the wall, termites in the wall that are, that are slowly devouring the house. You don't know any better because you don't see any termites. Everything's beautiful. Everything's positive. And you're redecorating and you're painting and you're doing all this stuff. Meanwhile, the framing of the house is being turned into, you know, cork board. And you have no idea, but that's that's what happens in the cult of positivity. So just because somebody is positive all the time, it doesn't mean that the egos are not creating a great deal of negative energy in the subconscious mind and they're feeding there and they're multiplying and they're growing. Now, about the power that, that our being uses, and is that the same power, the same energy as the egos covet? It goes a little further than that. It gets a little deeper than that. When you comprehend that the strength of spirit to 
be all that one can be can get hijacked, can get diverted very cleverly to some other enterprise such that there are individuals, many of them, who are de facto experts at playing Xbox or PlayStation or some particular game and there's no particular reward in it for them. There's no professional gaming league surrounding that particular game. They've literally put thousands, if not tens of thousands of hours of their life into practicing that game, into memorizing, into learning, into mastering every conceivable possible aspect and element of that game. And all they have are so-called bragging rights. And often on the internet, they use a handle anyway, which means they're completely anonymous. Now, it is very, very difficult to accept and believe that that individual was born to master a video game, that they put so much time and energy and effort of themselves into something so utterly and completely inconsequential that it has no bearing whatsoever on anyone or anything. It is a complete and total life suck. It is a black hole, but they can, they can do incredible things what nobody else can do in that particular game. So what? Nobody cares. It doesn't matter. They're not helping anyone. And they're certainly not helping themselves. It is a completely and totally mechanical, reactive activity. It's a pastime. It is just a form of stimulation. But for whatever reason, they're, st they're so identified with it, it, it captured them. And they channel all of their strength of spirit into that completely empty, ultimately worthless activity. Even if you're cynical, you can argue that someone like Muhammad Ali became an inspiration for a generation of young people. He, he became a, a political activist. He inspired many people and he, he was, by no means was he perfect, but at least he used his climbing to the heights of his sport and becoming, you know, be calling, being called the champ and being considered one of the greatest of all time if not the greatest of all time, he used his position there to have some sort of benefit for others. Plus, he had a, a fair amount of wealth that, that he also contributed and to help inner city youths and, and um, other, other things that he was involved with. And then eventually he was also, because he was diagnosed with Parkinson's, he uh, became a spokesperson for that illness as well. What could he have accomplished if he wasn't a boxer? Who knows? He might have been a great imam in the Islamic faith. Who knows? He might have been a great preacher in the Christian faith. Who knows? He might have been any number of things. He might have been the first black president of the United States, for all we know, because he had the charisma and he had the intelligence and he had the strength of spirit. But he didn't go down that road. He went down the road of professional boxer and it is what it is. We sometimes wonder how many Muhammad Ali-like individuals there are who are squirreled away in their basements, pouring their heart and soul into a plastic box and an LCD screen and a plastic controller in their hand. And they are just pouring their strength of spirit into this downward spiral, this toilet bowl. It would be wonderful to be able to reach them but that's naive and that's foolish because many of these individuals are not interested whatsoever in anything spiritual, in anything self-development. They're completely obsessed with these mechanical games, these entertainments, these forms of stimulation for their mind that, uh, that distract them. And again, you know, if someone can come along and present us with the case, self-evident experiential knowledge, that they were born to do that and that their innermost being 
is driving them to that and that really is their passion, they really are living their bliss, we can't rule it out. We certainly can't rule it out, but that's one hell of a case to make with us. We cannot afford to be naive. We cannot afford to be ignorant of just how clever and insidious the forces of desire are. Their ability to hijack our gifts, our highest faculties, including our strength, our strength of spirit, our willpower, our devotion, our dedication, and all of our energy, our creative juices, our creative force. And if you want to know what that looks like when someone who was here on the path of the Bodhisattva, when they get hijacked, when they become tempted and corrupted by the Black Lodge, and all of their faculties, all of their gifts, all of their charisma and strength of spirit and intelligence, and, and when all of that gets turned to the dark side, as it were, you end up with the individual who rose to power in Germany following the First World War and following the Great Depression. And he, he was able to inspire and unite an entire nation. And he did that with the strength of spirit. But he kept going and he fulfilled the Black Lodge's desire for power and dominance. And the result was the Second World War. But make no mistake that all of that was made possible because of that individual's strength of spirit, which was inverted. We cannot afford to be naive and we cannot make the mistake that all of these new agers make, where they think that being spiritual and being in spirit somehow makes one immune to the forces of desire, to the forces of demoralization, to the forces of despair, the forces that seek to divide and conquer us, to dispirit us, because they are many and they are not only clever and subtle and insidious and powerful, but this is their age. This is their era, the Iron Age of humanity. This is the Kali Yuga. This is their time to shine in their own way. This is their time to where they impress one another and they impress themselves with how good a job that they do at dispiriting, at demoralizing humanity. And we are witnessing right now the demoralization of North America and the West with all this woke crap and this uh, artificial intelligence crap, this transhumanism and wokeness and all this stuff. This is all part of the demoralization, the turning all of society into a, uh, into a massive collective machine mind a hive mind. That's what communism is. Look, they've already succeeded in China. Now they're working on the West. And it's working. Regardless of what you believe, regardless of what people say, there is no stopping this. There is no stopping the progress of entropy. You might be able to slow it down. You might be able to stall it. You might be able to, you know, win little battles here and there, but you cannot win this war. Humanity cannot win this war. Just as a human body cannot defeat old age and death, if all it's working with is its ego. In order to defeat the rules of the simulation, you have to work with faculties that are outside of the simulation. 